thank you all for coming to the second annual, I hope it's annual, <laughs> at least it's the second, game day, which is the culmination of uh, a computer game science capstone course. And to start out with an introduction, let me introduce our Dean, Hal Stern. Thanks, Dan. Uh, a great pleasure to be here, and I don't want to take too much time because there's a lot of games to, to be seen and to be played. Uh, I, we take great pride in the computer game science major, which is, I guess, going on six years old or so and is the second biggest major in the school already, at least according to the last numbers I saw. Um, so, and a lot of enthusiasm is evident by the crowd tonight. Um, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, you should have gotten a program on the way in. Uh, the bottom of the back has a list of the many people that it took to put this on. Um, and I don't want to insult anyone by leaving them out, so I won't mention any of them explicitly by name. But it includes the staff um, of the Institute for Virtual Environments and Computer Games, which is a research center, um, started in the school and is now a campus-wide research center headed by Professor Magda Elzarki, who I saw before. I don't know where she is now. But, um, um, and so the staff of that institute has been played a big part of this. Um, also want to thank the Video Game Developers Club for all that they do. Uh, the presentations we're going to see are not them, but their game will game or two will be out and about on the, d during the demo time. Um, as I said, the school takes great pride in this major. Um, what you are going to see tonight are the projects that were done as part of the computer game science capstone course. So I especially want to thank the instructors, and I'm sure the students do as well, um, Dan Frost and Richard Wang for their contributions to making this go. Um, we hope that you enjoy the games and the evening. It's a lot of fun. And uh, one of the things I've learned in my uh, almost six years as dean is, you know, the market speaks. There's a big market for this. There's a lot of people here. I won't mention any companies by name, but sometimes we have companies in to do a showcase in the evening, and we get very few people. Um, it's a little embarrassing sometimes for us, but um, this obviously speaks to uh, you know a great deal of enthusiasm, um, and so I am looking forward to seeing your work. Thank okay, you. thanks, Hap. Okay, so yeah, thanks to the people who are listed here, but they're listed here. Um, so the schedule, uh, the plan is that we have eight teams that will each give an approximately nine or ten minute presentation of their game. And then, um, so in about an hour and a half, or however long that takes, we'll exit, and the, there will be dinner out here, and there will be games in the two rooms right below <coughs> this room. So the right one down is called 5011, two down is 4011, and there's 11 games, half of them on each floor, approximately. So the next hour and a half or two hours after we leave here will be an opportunity for you to play those games, talk to the students, and mingle and eat. Okay? So we'll start with Team Spectre and Normal Wars. So hello. Um, you know, this like the kick is, but uh, we are Team Spectre. Uh, our game is called Normal Wars. It's Professor Frost who introduced us. Um, I am Tyler Hogan. Uh, I'm a gameplay designer and programmer. Uh, this is Dante, Hi. Uh, our producer, gameplay design or programmer, and system architect. Uh, we have Corey on the end there, uh, who's a gameplay programmer and level designer. Uh, Chandler, who is a game designer and gameplay programmer as well, and uh, Charles, who is our UI designer and programmer. Uh, we have two outside of UCI members too working on our game. Uh, one of them is here tonight, Clifton Carlson. Uh, he is our sound engineer and designer. He did all of the original music and sound effects. So a brief overview of our game. Um, it's a top-down 2D arena fighter uh, with local co-op up to four players. You saw on the main screen, those were player icons that you can spin around. Um, I think kind of like a Hotland Miami meets Super Smash Brothers or some other arena fighter. So it's instant kills, you shoot fireballs, uh, you have to stay away from almost everything. It kind of gets a bullet hell kind of feel to the game. Um, so we brought two game modes to the demo today. Uh, last Man Standing, which is exactly as it sounds, you're fighting to be the last person standing in the arena. And then you play multiple rounds and as you be the last man standing you accumulate points and eventually win. Uh, then there's deathmatch, which is standard kill-based deathmatch, uh, where you can't hide in the corner because 
Last Man Standing, you might be able to just sit in the corner. This one, you actively have to go out and kill people, and there is no, nowhere to hide. Uh, we have three levels today. Um, we'll show off a couple of them in our demo, and you can play the rest of them down on the demo floor. Uh, but the idea with this game is that each level has a different theme to it. So you could be traveling through times, even. Uh, you could go from a medieval gladiator arena, uh, those are two different things, I know, uh, or a rave with lasers flying across the screen. Uh, so our game, as I said earlier, is all about shooting fireballs to kill your opponent. So your primary ability is to shoot a fireball. And those will bounce off of multiple surfaces and make you explode violently when, when it hits you. Uh, to counter this, you have a defensive ability, a shield, which will not only protect you, but deflect the, the fireballs as well. So you could be skillful with your shield and deflect them back at another player. Uh, in addition to this defensive ability, you have a dash, which, although useful so that you can dodge fireballs, could also be dangerous. You could dodge into another fireball, even. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and jump out of this and go ahead and play a real game of Last Man Standing to get, show you guys kind of what our game looks like in full force. So while these guys are playing, you can watch them as I talk, um, I can give you a little bit of background about our process through creating this game. Uh, this game actually was not what we started the course on. We had a 3D puzzle, mobile mobile puzzle game called Apartment Ghost, and that's where Project Spectre comes from, our Team Spectre. Uh, this game we did an Unreal 3D, um, it needed lots of models, lots of AI to put into it, and we just didn't have the time through the 20 weeks of this course to make it fun. Uh, it took a lot of toll just making an AI, and we didn't have much visual progress throughout the weeks just because the AI would get better and there wouldn't be much feedback with it. Uh, so we switched the second quarter to this game um, and dropped to 2D sprite-based art, uh, which was a lot faster for our artists to produce art to put into the game and a lot easier for us to develop for since it was just a simple pick up and play game that didn't require too much of a learning curve. Um, so to conclude, uh, we have, we're planning on releasing this game as a full feature release sometime in the end of summer. Um, we'll put it, we have much more features to put into it, including power-ups, larger, bigger levels, uh, even, uh, Oh, AI opponents as well, so we're going to get back to the AI just as we have more time. Um, but yeah, so uh, thank you for, for hearing us out and watching our game. Uh, does anybody have any questions for us to answer? Yes. So is this uh, made in Unreal as well, or is that...? Uh, sorry, this is built in Unity 2D. Um, we switched over to Unity just because as we were working with Unreal, um, they have a system called Blueprints, which you can also do classic scripting, code scripting. Um, but we started by using Blueprints, which didn't allow us to review code as easily on GitHub. You can't actually see what's inside the files. This is a compiled as a binary file. There might be somewhere around that, I'm not sure. Uh, so we switched to Unity since we all knew it, and <coughs> you can actually see the code. It was a lot faster to get features into the game. So, any other questions? Yes? Uh, you say you switch games midway through. Yes. So what? Uh, I guess I kind of want wanted to hear your uh, feelings on that. You you said mm -hmm. technically what you went through in consideration, but your own feelings on it. Did you feel like this was a step back for you, or did you actually take the feel that this is what we have to do? Or like, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that. We were pretty much unanimous on the vote to switch. Um, that was kind of the end last <coughs> week or two of uh, of our win or fall quarter. Um, it just, like, it wasn't panning out to what we thought it would be or what it could be if we had put more time or had more experience working with the type of AI that we were making. Um, so it was kind of a unanimous ex experience for it. Nobody was really too hurt by moving. Uh, we also had come into the first quarter with that game idea. So I think a lot of us just kind of decided, hey, we we're stuck with, or a lot of us thought first quarter that we're stuck with that idea. Um, and we never really had a huge, like, from scratch uh, gameplay collaboration or, or design session. We only designed about the game, not what the game could be as a completely different idea. Um, so once we did that, it, it was really fast, actually. To, to, or we picked up our, our lost time quickly and uh, made this in, in 10 weeks. So I thought I saw one more hand over here. That's it. 
Cool. Um, so lastly, we would like to, I'm going to get this out just so I don't forget anybody by accident. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our mentors. Uh, from we had, We're in a partnership with Blizzard uh, these last two quarters, and their employees come in and mentor us on our game, tell us a little bit about how to make it, uh, some feedback into the game, etc. Um, so all of our mentors, we'd like to thank our Tim Ford, uh, Phil Orwig, Paul Blackie, who I see quite a few of them right over in that corner, uh, and in this quarter, Kevin Calderon and Jason Roberts. Uh, they were invaluable in making this game, provided us with valuable feedback to make it actually fun and playable. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank our professors, Professor Frost and Wayne, for almost the same thing, guiding us in creating this game and providing us valuable feedback. Um, so thank you once again for seeing our demo, and we will be on floor 40, or room 4011 down below, and you can come play our game or ask more questions. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you Team Specter and Team Skipper will come up. And let me just reiterate the thanks to uh, Blizzard. There were 19 Blizzard staff who acted as mentors throughout the two quarters, which was really great. And also financially, Blizzard is supporting this event. And when you have dinner, you can thank Blizzard for the yummy food. Okay. Uh, hello, we are Team Skipper. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Long. I was uh, the director on the project. Uh, this is Evie Smith. Uh, she was a programmer. <coughs> Eric Toy, he was our UI UR artist. Connor Stokes was a designer. Jason Chu um, was our producer. And uh, Kevin Zimmerly was our um, uh, another programmer. Uh, now, on this project, we had uh, quite a bit of outside help. Uh, so I'm going to make sure I get this, this done at the top. So uh, <coughs> from here, from UCI, uh, we have Ben Chef, who uh, an MFA student, who uh, helped us out with our music and sound. Uh, and by help us out, I mean made it all. <laughs> uh, we had a uh, Travis Hickman from LCAD. He was our art director, uh, and uh, also from LCAD was uh, Kyle Valentine, Ricky Chu, Emily, <coughs> Emily Butnicki, Emily Zarko, uh, Matthew McEwen, who uh, just won the Blizzard Student Art Contest for character art. Um, so congrats to him. Uh, uh, Chelsea uh, Doster, Kevin Liang, uh, and then from IBC we have Kevin Liang. Noah Christensen and Nishin uh, Chowdhury, who did um, animations on one of our um, enemies that you'll see. So this was a large uh, team project. Uh, for, uh, we got together in May of last year, and uh, we decided that we wanted to do uh, a 3D game in Unreal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, well, we're going to take a look at our level right now. Um, right now it looks a bit more like a PowerPoint than a game. Um, but. This is what it looks like nice. We will play it in a high frame rate mode in a second. <laughs> um, so, uh, last minute build complications and whatnot. Uh, so we decided we wanted to do a 3D game, and we wanted, uh, we kind of wanted an approach of uh, kind of uh, exploration and uh, magic, like a magical setting. Uh, those were our initial goals, and uh, through a lot of iteration we came up with the idea of having a game about combat um, and, like, and spell, spell crafting. Uh, so you're a wizard person, and you make spells. Um, and we decided, uh, we had this whole story about how you're a sailor that crash landed on an uncharted Caribbean island during the Napoleonic Wars, and stuff went awry on that island before you got there, and now you're discovering it. That's not in the game now, uh, but it did inform our decisions, right? It informed, you know, what our models look like, what the environments look like, uh, things like that. It was, a, it was still fun to, like, kind of toy with in our heads. Um, so yeah, so this is our game. Um, it's a first person combat game. Uh, where you cast spells. Let's just see our, our one first basic spell. So, yeah. So, this, why don't we go to the in editor mode so you can actually see motion? Yeah. So, um, our game consists of spell crafting. So you make up a you make a spell out of three components. Yeah, much better. <laughs> so, um, so that's our most basic one, which is just our our uh, fire missile. Uh, so here you, we have our spell crafting system. Um, so the, each of those three components, each of those three slots are identical. They just hop key to one, two, and three on the keyboard. And each one of those columns is a different element. So we have, we classified them into forms, which is the shape and how the spell travels through space. So we have a missile, we have like an explosion and a melee attack. We have the aspect, which is the damage effect that it has on the enemies. And then we have the accent, which is um, kind of a, a, a wild card. Uh, all it does is add risk and reward. So, for example, we have Blood Magic, which makes your spells five times more powerful, but at the expense of uh, a fifth of your health. 
and health is an extremely precious resource in our game, which I haven't told you the title of. It's called The Refiner's Fire. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that. So this is the game, The Refiner's Fire, um, and it's about uh, spellcrafting these spells to fight a uh, monster, so let's see one. All right, so uh, we, we initially started out trying to have a kind of like a story-based linear, not super linear, but like a discoverable area, something like a small, a small area in Bioshock or a small area in Dark Souls. Our goal was like 30 minutes to an hour of gameplay, and definitely not up to that quality because we're somewhat realistic. Um, and so uh, our mentors our, our, in our first quarter, uh, Dan, Mo Dan Moss and uh, Mike, kind of sat us down and said, hey, let's just do uh, one room. Um, uh, Wyatt uh, Chang also had that idea for us. And uh, we, we kind of we, we sat through that process, and in the second quarter, uh, we kind of decided that we had the spellcrafting system and this combat system, and that was actually somewhat fun. And so we decided to kind of focus on that. And so now we created these smaller arenas where we can uh, fight these enemies. Uh, so this particular enemy um, fires lava that like, but it's like green evil lava, and um, and it creates fires on the floor. And those uh, he can only walk in fire, and you take damage when you're in it, as you've heard from the efforts. Um, and so he, so it's kind of this weird like zone control game with this enemy. Uh, he's one of two that we have in the game. Um, that's hitting the lip there. So, um, but yeah, uh, we, we, uh, our other uh, mentors, um, Anders and uh, Kevin, also uh, provided a bunch of valuable feedback in terms of like how to think about our game. Um, <laughs> from minute to minute, our second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour. We didn't get around to that last one, but um, but we do have it. We just keep playing. Let's try. All right, be sure to see lots of spells, because they're, they're all pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's our uh, spider area of effect spell, so when uh, he enters it, he takes damage, although he's, looks like he's just hanging out just outside of it. Yeah. Um, let's see some of the accents, because those are actually fun. So, uh, so right now we've been playing with none. Uh, so Blood Magic will do a crazy powerful spell, uh, but at the expense of your health. Um, and uh, those those three orbs you see above the health globe are um, are the only like health resources you have. They recharge your health just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so so blood magic is our most powerful one. So let's see a uh, charge. Them. And then this one is kind of like a Mega Man type deal where we can kind of hold up the spell and it travels and get a cool effect. Uh, so these, uh, the player animation, the model, were done by Matthew McEwen, the, the winner of the art contest. Uh, the spider model um, was done by our students at LCAD, and the animations were done by the students at IBC. Um, and then uh, the other guy with the green fire uh, was bought off Turbo Squid. So <laughs> uh, eventually, uh, you know, we kind of just decided to just get assets on our own. None of us are skilled 3D animators or artists, and so we had to eventually um, buy and find stuff. And, uh, we're very grateful we did. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the Refiner's Fire. Uh, we're pretty proud of it. Uh, we um, set out to learn about Unreal uh, in May. We had only really kind of tinkered a little bit, uh, but now I I dream in Blueprint, um, and I feel like I know this engine too well. Um, and uh, you know, we we set a game that has like some interesting dynamics and some interesting gameplay in a 3D space, which we haven't really attempted before. And uh, we were grateful that we were able to kind of have this opportunity to do that and work with people in the outside of our school to uh, to get help with it. And it I, uh, doesn't always look like it, but I feel like it pays off. Quite a bit. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Have you ever heard of a uh, Blood Magic? Yeah. 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 Uh, so the question was, have we heard of a game called Lichdom Battle Mage? Uh, so one of the things I pitched to our group here in May was, how about Lichdom Battle Mage, but good? Um, I, I enjoyed quite a bit of Lichdom Battle Mage. Uh, first of all, it has some beautiful art in it. Uh, but the problem I had with that game is it was the most fiddly, like, there was a stat called Mastery that stacked on enemies, and then there's another stat called Burn that affected the rate at which you burned the Mastery stacked on enemies. Right, and that was just like one of like 36 stats to put on a spell, and like each, like I, every time I was making a choice about what spell to put in Lich and Battle Mage, 
It felt it felt so inconsequential. I was like, ah, this one's new, and I didn't I didn't feel like I was making interesting choices. And so that's um, so in this one we have 36 distinct choices that the players can feel a little bit creative because they're still combining things, you know, kind of like alchemy. Uh, but you kind of get but there's like that's a smaller number of them that still feel interesting. Any other questions? That blown away, huh? What was the biggest challenge you guys faced while you were working on this? Asset pipeline. Okay. Like, 900%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Along those lines, like cross-school communication and things like that. Can you elaborate what you mean by asset pipeline? Uh, so the process of which uh, the designers speak to the concept artist about what we want, and the concept artist makes it, and then that gets handed off then then gets handed back to the designers for approval, and then to the modeler, to um, to the uh, rigger, and then to the texturer and the animators. Um, I don't, so each of those states was done very well, and expertly crafted, and very quickly. Uh, however, the transitions to those <laughs> uh, did not. Uh, the, the spider model that you're hearing yell at you right now um, was modeled in a matter of weeks, uh, rigged in less than a week and animated in like six or something like that. However, it took us 14 weeks to get it out of the modeler's hands into a rigger's hand. Like, it, it just, there's this huge gap of like telephone that just dropped the line. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Steve Diamond. There they are. All right, I am Wilson. I am the artist of this game. Uh, then is Eric, one of our programmers, and Devante on the far right, or left on your perspective. And this is Evan, our designer. Devante is our programmer, along with Eric. So we are Team Diamond, and we created the game Space Zombie Dinosaurs. Don't ask how it came up. It just stuck with us. All right, so we made this mobile game, and it works on Android with Unity, and the art is done in Photoshop. So we wanted to make a bubble shooter, but have it more exciting, instead of just you patiently putting the shots in, and we want to have something you can combat. So we're taking inspiration from newer games, something like Power Shuffle. All right, let's get this demo going. All right, so here it is. We have different types of eggs and different types of dinosaurs and does different types of damage depending on which element you have. All right, you can tap on the screen or you can align the shots to make it shoot. Got some text with it, please. Oh, there we go. All right, big shot. So you can ricochet, collect. And when you collect out of the three colors, it stacks up onto this can on the side. Once it's fully loaded, it returns back to the sender and there's only two ways this game will end. Either you get crushed by the eggs, or you defeat that dino. Keep doing more damage. As you collect more eggs, you have this power meter on the right side charging up. And once it's enough, the screen will highlight on the bottom, you can tap on it to do extra damage or interesting effects. As you defeat each dino, you get a new one, different types. Each will get stronger, bigger, and more difficult as it progresses. All right, so there's another interesting feature you can do. If you don't like your egg, you can click on the bottom left side of the egg you see previewing to switch out the one you want to use. You can do this anytime you want. We want a key emphasis that you have a choice, and your choices can help influence your battle against the dino space zombies. Uh, you're getting in big trouble right now. Use the power bar. Shoot it. Super effective. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gotta get a slide now. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Stalling until we get the site. Oh, there we go. 
right? Lots of redundant stuff. Next slide. Yep, you know who we are. All right, so here's our inspiration. So we took inspiration from Bust to Move and Pokemon Shuffle for the great idea of doing a bubble shooter, but more emphasis on action intensity. Next slide. So yeah, we made it in Unity, as well as we use Scene Sharp. We've also used assets that I've made on Photoshop. Also, Buffalo Wild Links was very helpful in our process. But we couldn't do this without Bitbucket for how to transfer files and sharing it among us. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so I've explained most of the core game. And there's actually a health bar in the center of a number. It used to be on the top. The game used to actually be just one solid screen. And you had a monster attack you individually, and only you can damage it. So we scrap that and have the eggs just crush you, since everyone's more focused on the center of the screen. Next slide. So yeah, we have the progression. So there actually are dinosaurs that are babies, then we get them to fuller size, and then become zombies once you kill them all. And it's going to rinse and repeat for every, I think, five, and there's about two different types of dinos, T-Rexes and Triceratopses. So we introduced an elemental type, but there's actually two types of elemental. The triangle of fire beating grass or earth, and earth beating water, and water beating fire. We also introduced a dark and light, which both counters each other. So this will do double damage or extra damage if you match up a nice color against the effective damage. Next slide. Right. So we want to give a special thanks to our professors Frost and Wayne, also our mentors Paul, Kevin, Michael, and Craig. Really helped us on emphasizing gameplay first. You can think about design later. Just make it fun. So thank you all for listening to us and Team Diamond. Thank you, Team Diamond. Of course, this is a mobile game, so you can't really get it till you have it in your hand, and you can do that downstairs afterwards. Okay, Team Bridge, come on up. They're over there. Hello, we are Team Bridge, and we are doing an and we did an Android game on Unity 2D, and it is called Bully Bunny. Yes. Bunny Bullies. God, that's confusing. Um, <laughs> my name is Brendan Tellyard, and this is and this is Oscar. This is Will, and this is Cappy, and Victor's missing. He has a test right now. Um, I was in charge of all the gameplay programming that you'll see. Oscar and Victor worked together on the UI and helping me with other gameplay uh, programming if I needed it. Will was our Git master, everything that needed to be done for the Git. Will was there, and he also did all of our production and uh, made sure that everything was going through the pipeline very smoothly and making sure that everybody was doing their jobs and doing it on time. Uh, Kathy did all of the art that you'll see. She did an excellent job. We also had help with um, sound from a uh, graduate student. His name is Jordan, and he helped us out a lot. And what you'll notice about our, our process is there's no designer. We all worked together, and we sat in a room, and every decision was run through the whole team. Anytime that we wanted to make a different iteration, we would just suggest it, and we'd all talk about it and try to get it done. So this is a group design project, and <laughs> I'm pretty proud of the fact that we all got to work together, and we all agreed upon the design that you'll see. So. What is this game? So you play as a bunny, and you are going to play against your friends who are also bunnies. However, these bunnies time travel, and they also move through space through portals. Now, why they're doing this is to get carrots from different time periods, because that's all they want. They're greedy and apparently lustful, because there's a lot of bunnies. Um, but they are just in the search for carrots, but they don't care about anything else. And what you're going to see is that there's a lot of other stuff that occupies the world that's not carrots. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take that stuff and you're going to give it to your other brethren and your sisters because it's not your problem, it's their problem. And so what you're going to do is you're going to play on your mobile device with a group of friends, up to five players, and you are going to pass and play. There's no networking, you just play on one phone, pass it to the next person, and pass it to the next person. You're going to take trash in these different objects that you'll see, and you're going to pass it through portals to different players that'll correspond to a color. So if I am green player and I get passed trash through my green portal, I will see all the trash that the other players have passed to me. It's quite annoying. We also have a bomb that if you put it through a portal, 
Um, it will blow up all over your screen, much like ink in Mario Kart, and you won't be able to see what you're doing. You'll have to just deal with it. Why don't you continue? All right. And so there are different types of portal tactics that you can do. You can gang up all on one person if you see that they're in the lead. You can completely trash their game, because the more trash that goes through, the lower and lower their score gets. However, if they keep collecting carrots, their score will go up. But you're trying to really be the winner in this, so you're going to feed as much trash to whoever's ahead and see if you can knock them down a peg, because they don't need it for their ego. Um, so let's, why don't we play it? Let's try it. We would also like to thank all of our mentors for Blizzard. They helped a lot in the design iteration. Uh, Grant, Jason, and Phil all helped us a ton. They helped us iterate through all the process and get it all up and running, and really helped us narrow our design down so that we could get something that was fun and get to the fun really quickly. Go ahead, let's try it. So, uh, Will is going to start first, and he's going to be passed into a starting round. So each round is 15 seconds. He's going to try and click on as many carrots as that he can and pass the trash into the different portals. One will be Kathy, and one will be Oscar. So here he's trying to pass all the trash he can and not get those portals into the trash. He moves ahead on the line, and we'll see how everybody else does. All right, so Oscar is up, and he is red player. So he's got to put his stuff into the white and the yellow. So he's going to try and grab as many carrots as he can because they're worth more points than the trash uh, negates. So he's going to keep clicking as quickly as he can on as many carrots before the time limit runs out, but it doesn't look like he's doing a very good job anyway. <laughs> so he's probably screwed, but it's okay. Um, so he did okay. He passed Kathy, but he didn't pass Will because Will did pretty well. <laughs> All right, Kathy's going to go ahead and she gets past it, so she becomes yellow. And let's see how she does. This will be interesting. And she passed carrots. If you see, the carrot went right through the portal, so someone else is getting points that she's not getting. <laughs> oh, more carrots. It's okay. She can do it. She's got five seconds, three seconds. Oh, God, I don't think this is going well. Oh, it's better than I expected. <laughs> so she, she passed the starting line. That's good. <laughs> All right, Will's going to try it and see if he can keep his lead. So he's got some stuff from the last round. What you're going to see is that they're colored from where they came from. So if it is yellow, it came from the yellow player, and if it is red, it came from the red player. Oh no, he passed a bomb in, he cannot see at all, but he can still interact with the screen. But I think he'll be okay, because he's pretty far ahead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Oscar's gonna give it another try. Let's see if he can do a little bit better than last time. No pressure. All right, so he's got all the, oh, passing carrots. Right to Kathy. All right, Kathy needs them back anyway. <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't think you needed to do that, but that's okay. So he's still trying to pass all the things back to Kathy, because he just doesn't like Kathy. I don't think he sees well as a threat, so he's just shoving it all to Kathy. <laughs> Let's see how she does. All right, Kathy, you can catch up. You're past a ton of carrots. Don't blame a mouse. <laughs> so she's passing it all back to Oscar, because who cares if Will's in the lead? <laughs> oh, oh, she's so close. All right, they're on their final round, and let's see how it goes. So Will, we're going to see if Will just is going to steamroll ahead. He's got two carrots hit left. He's going to try to pass everything. Now, what you notice is Will's trying to click around that bomb. He doesn't want that bomb to go off because he can't see what's coming out. He needs to try to pass as much trash as he can. He may get a perfect round out of this. Oh, he's missing one. Oh, it's close. Still moved a little bit ahead. All right, come on, Oscar, you can do this. You got this, you got all the things. Utilize it to your advantage. Carrot, Oscar, it's like right there. Come on, Biggish, there you go. <laughs> hey, Biggish. Hi. Oh, uh, apparently he just melded out, didn't do very well. It's okay. I don't blame you. I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy has no carrots left. She was just passed a bunch of trash. They really didn't like Kathy this round, but they didn't like her that much. I think she'll be okay. Let's see. Oh. Uh, so, Will is our winner. <laughs> Good job. I'm going to give a round of applause. I wasn't playing, so it, it's not really a challenge for him. <laughs>
All right, so our postmortem is, uh, we had a lot of fun making this game. We also had fun playing it. It was really fun to interact with each other and play it around and see what different things we could come up with that fit the world and fit the theme and come up with a very kind of strange and interesting premise and theme for the whole game. Um, we had fun making the UI because we wanted to take a different approach. We started with a standard score, Pac-Man, uh, Galaga, you name it, old arcade styles, and we wanted to get rid of it. So what we had is the clean percentages and the carrots. You can try to collect carrots, get as much trash, try to stay away from the score. We also had a unique gameplay flow. We wanted to, our biggest challenge was we wanted you to interact with the other players. We wanted your gameplay to have an effect on their game without having networking. And I think we really accomplished that, which I found, we found very difficult challenge, but we overcame it. Um, the gameplay is chaotic. It's crazy. It's really, you have to go really fast and try to make a bunch of decisions really quickly, and your eyes have to keep moving and try and pick up all, all the right terms. As far as the negatives, we uh, remade the game quite a few times, but it's okay. We came out with a product that we really found and that we liked. I want to thank again our mentors for all of the work that they put in for helping us and for lending us their time. It was really wonderful that you guys came out and helped us uh, polish our design. Uh, thank you. And you can play our game at 4011. Okay. Thank you, Team Boulder. Dark stuff. Ready to go. Hi, guys. We're Team Boulder, and this is our game, Breaking Butt. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to start with a special thanks to our four mentors from Fall and Winter Ben Dean, uh, Steve Shimizu, Tim Ford, and Dan Moss. Uh, your help has been very valuable in shaping our game from start to finish. Um, I'm Anthony. I'm producer, and most of our team are just mostly programmers, except for our one MFA student. Um, David is not here right now. He's taking a test, sadly. Um, this is Dion. He's been um, an animator and our particle, particle effects um, guy for this whole uh, our whole game. Um, this is Harry. He's most mainly responsible for our controller integration to the game. Unity and controllers don't really mix too well, so thank you, Harry. And this is Junbai. He um, designed most of our UI assets and um, did a really great job on it. And um, Andrea, our MFA student, uh, she couldn't make it, but uh, she did all the sound effects and the music for this game. So our game is a 2D platform fighter very similar to Smash Brothers, um, except we only show to do 1v1 uh, uh, plays. So we also drew inspiration from Street Fighter. So primary objective of any fighting game is just defeat your opponent. For us, there's two ways, like in Street Fighter, whittle their health down. Um, also, um, like Smash, we have stocks. Uh, as you can see with the heart, that's the number of stocks. It's usually not that high. Um, also, um, like in Smash, you can edge out your opponent from the arena, which is pretty damn fun too. So our, we developed this mostly for with controllers in mind, since two people on a keyboard is just super awkward. Okay, so the way you, uh, so you move by using either the D-pad or the control stick, left, right, or jump, and like in Smash, facing down. So. Unlike uh, Street Fighter and Smash, our, all our attacks are pretty much uh, mapped to a single button, or buttons, um, mainly to make it easier for the player to learn. Because we found that um, players, at least with uh, fighting games, it's, really, it's a big learning curve for any beginner. So we decided to make it a lot easier, just make it um, all uh, do one attack for each button. There's a jab, haymaker, flip kick, and flash kick. As you can notice with all these moves, there's two punches and two kicks. Similar to Street Fighter, there's two types of punches and two types of kicks. But with our game, we mostly developed in mind a certain mechanic, is that each of these moves are tied to a single limb. And with that limb, you can break those limbs off. And if you break those limbs off, you lose that move. Uh, obviously, the counteract, you can pick it up. You can pick up someone else's moves, too. So you can steal their parts and use it against them. Pretty cool, right? So uh, you might have noticed that little thing at the top of the 
uh, characters heads. That's actually, um, as you can notice, um, the colors are mapped to the buttons on the controller, uh, which help out with indicating whether or not you have that move ready. So if you lose all moves, this is what you look like. <laughs> and you start taking damage over time just to speed up the gameplay. And the only move you have is a headbutt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, our, our, one of the things we're most proud of with this game is our, our set of rocket moves. Because you can break off a limb, you break off someone else's limbs, why not break off your own and just use it against them? So, here's a rocket punch. Rocket kick, upward rocket, downward <laughs> rocket, you know, anti-air, spikes, cool stuff. Like in Smash and any other fighting game, there's blocking, which it'll block and you won't receive any damage for any of the regular moves. But with a rocket move, it's unblockable. <laughs> and it's pretty cool. And like in Smash, plenty of stages. So uh, let's show off the game now. Let me change this. Controller, right? Okay. Uh, well, wait, hold on. Sound on? Nope, it's off. Damn it. Uh, as you can see, there's, it's, it's, very similar to Smash, because you can move around all around the stage. And, uh, a lot of camping right now. It's really hard to commentate on this kind of gameplay. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun to watch. With our rocket moves, it's all, it's high risk, high reward, because you can instantly just throw it off the map. And it's, it's, it's pretty fun though. Yeah, pretty, pretty fun. Right? And then when you die, you do lose all your, all the remaining parts, and they do lie on the ground in case uh, you know you start losing stuff. You want to pick it up, save yourself from dying. And there are combos in the game. There's a little hard to pull off, except for that. Ooh. In previous iterations of the game, we would have a ton of parts laying around on the ground, and it would clutter the ground a lot, and you could shove players with it, and it was pretty fun, funny to watch. Uh, but we decided there's just too much crap on the ground. Come on, man. Jump him. Jump him. Oh, you're going to die. <laughs> As you can see, he's only got that one green button move left, whereas our other player has all all sets back since he died, so it resets, and now he's pretty screwed. Oh, 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 one thing to add, the headbutt move, it increases knockback the more health you lose. So pretty much when you're about to die, that'll probably probably send you off the map really far, you know? And that's our game, Breaking Butt. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Team Boulder. That was great. <laughs> Team Tsunami. Come on down. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We are Team Tsunami, and our game is A Brush With Danger. So first, I'd like to introduce the team that made the game possible. Um, first off, we got Jeffrey Kitano, who is actually not here taking a test. Uh, frankly, this is more important, kind of selfish of him, but okay. Uh, he did the AI programming for our game. Um, here's Kyle, he's the, the idea man, he came up with the game. Uh, he does all the network engineer, uh, engine programming. Um, really a man of many, many hats. <laughs> and it's helped us get through a lot of our troubleshooting. Uh, I'm Chris Johnson, uh, I'm the sound programmer. I do some of the uh, sound designing as well, creating the assets. Um, this is Jocelyn Cruz. She does the gameplay and the UI programming. Um, and this is Vivian. She is our artist, technical artist, level designer. She's made every single art asset in our game herself. 
all around them. And then we have outside of the class, Kelsey Halverson, who is a sound grad student who um, helped us make most of the sound assets. And then also we have, uh, as you can see, uh, in our great teamwork, uh, the Coco's 2D engine that we used was not exactly a team player. Um, but you know, we had to get him to come along and help us eventually. Okay, so we're gonna get it right into our game here. Uh, a Brush with Danger is a multiplayer cooperative puzzle game where you work as a team to uh, create a drawing. And if you create the drawing that matches the, uh, the drawing, if you get it correct, you move on to the next level. And uh, we use 8-bit sounds, pixel art, and um, it's a multiplayer game and it's online capable. So you can join up with four friends, it's anywhere from one to four players. And um, the game supports uh, joystick or keyboard. And uh, as you can see, they're starting to draw. And um, if, you, if you get the color wrong, you'll see that there's uh, an X kind of on the tile that indicates it's the wrong tile. So you basically try to match the painting up top. And as you progress through the game, more and more obstacles will come and get in your way that makes the uh, drawing more difficult. So uh, as you complete the puzzles, um, everything that you actually create comes alive in the next level. And so as you go through the levels of the game and you create, you know, the uh, first one was this ghost girl. That was the first level and now she's come to life and she's a little pissed. She's probably sleeping and doing you know, eternal slumber. And, uh, uh, awoken her. So she's going to torment you the entire game. Uh, and so this level you're going to be making a uh, candy cane which ends up being a speed power-up that comes uh, into play throughout the whole game. And so every level something is coming to life that uh, is part of like a mysterious narrative um, and uh, adds uh, more and more features and mechanics to the gameplay. Well I forgot to mention that um, right now we're watching player one so um, each player, when they play, they have their own screen. So uh, as the levels get larger and larger, the screen will pan, and you'll see that um, the, the camera will basically follow your player. And um, yeah, the next stage gets much larger. We start small and increase the difficulty as you go along. And you can see Sam uh, teleports. We call our ghost Sam. And uh, she's going to be a big part of this game, as we'll see. Oh yeah, oh, we have simple controls. It's basically one button that acts as your, uh, you, your, you dip the paintbrush into the paint bucket and then the same button presses it. So you collect the paint by um, dipping your brush and that's what color you get. So you, if you want the blue paint, you go to the blue bucket. If you want the white paint, you go to the white bucket. And now on this level, um, there's be some candy power-ups that you unlock with the candy cane. And if you grab the candy, it's a speed boost power up, so you can go twice as fast. You'll see some players get it. But also, if the ghost gets it, she'll go twice as fast. So you see a player one and grab it, so he's flying now. So I'm going to try to skip the next level, show you. Now you have the pterodactyl in action. Um, and this level's gotten much bigger. Uh, and the pterodactyl is also another mechanic that's actually going to terrorize you. Um, when Sam is tired of chasing you herself, she'll actually start uh, whistling, and her pterodactyl will go into angry death mode and uh, pretty much just destroy players and all their progress. There you go, there's a whistle. And see, to, where's our pterodactyl? There he is, whoa, he's a fast one. All right, so we're going to talk about the tools that made the game possible. Um, of course, we use Git and GitHub for collaboration and uh, version control. Um, Coco's 2DX, our, our engine of choice, um, it was a lot more hands-on than a lot of the other engine options like Unreal and Unity, and we really wanted to enjoy the chance of getting uh, down and dirty with the code, seeing how the engine works, really uh, manually making everything ourselves. Um, of course, Visual Studio was uh, where we coded all our C++ code for the game. Um, tile was uh, how we made the maps for all the levels, tile maps. Um, and then I made, uh, the sound assets that I made that were 8-bit were made with a VFXer, which is like an 8-bit sound generator, which is kind of fun. Uh, the, network, the networking system was built from scratch uh, using Boost 
A0, A synchronous IO libraries and serial to serialize the data over the network. Um, it was really a challenge just building that whole network from scratch, but it was super rewarding because uh, we got to you know pick and choose everything that went over the network to synchronize the states. Um, and that was that was also part of the design challenge was figuring out as a team like what's going to be sent over the network and what's going to be local on each computer. And, um, wait, yeah. uh, we're, we're pretty happy with the way the game is right now. We, uh, we have a lot more ideas that we wanted to put in. Um, more puzzle mechanics, more obstacles. Uh, it, it took a long time, like just getting everything, working with the network and uh, figuring out our workflow. And so we didn't get to add quite everything we came up with, but um, what we'd like to do is, is spend another month or so on it and get it uh, in a state that we really like and, and publish it to some gaming websites and see what kind of interest there is to see if we want to pursue it with a Steam Greenlight or a Kickstarter or something like that. And we like to thank our mentors um, our, and our, our teachers. And uh, our, our mentors really helped us out our first quarter to really focus on a tight game loop. And, and what, what resulted was like, you know, we just, we focused on that tight gameplay and focused on that puzzle and just keeping it fun. And uh, of course, uh, helping us out, our mentors also technically giving us, uh, stopping us from making newbie mistakes. Um, and I think that's it. I mean, are there any questions? I only asked because you had the candy cane as one of your demos, but have you thought about a colorblind mode? Oh, well, we, t <laughs> we actually discussed this quite a bit. Um, do you want to? So uh, one of the considerations I had when drawing every single image was, even for normal people in the original images, they had trouble telling the colors apart. So when I was drawing all the images and all the art assets, I worked partially on everything desaturated. So even if it's a little more difficult, it should still be playable by colorblind people in its current state. Any other questions? Uh, you practically said that you have an online mode. Yeah, Did it's you mention it's local co-op, or you just decided online mode was the... Well, it's, it's, um, it's also local. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You mean like all four players sharing the same computer? Yeah. That's not implemented yet. That's definitely a possibility. Um, I thought about that, you know, maybe some split screen mode. But um, for now, it's, it's um, all four. Each player has their own computer, and they see what their player sees. What made you decide that was my curiosity because I thought online would make it a little bit more complicated. To well, the, that's we wanted the challenge. Uh, oh. We wanted to actually. I mean, we've taken some. We've had some good networking classes here, and uh, I, me personally, I, I thought that the future of games is network games. So I wanted to explore it as much as possible. Um, working, you know, that's why I wrote it from scratch was to like, okay, let's see how this how this stuff works. So. Okay, thank you, Team Tsunami. <laughs> Team Moonlight. Hello, everyone. We are Team Moonlight. So, about our game, <clears throat> take a game with a deep story and mix it in with time loop, and then you get our game, Karma Trauma. So, our game takes inspiration from time loops movies like Groundhog Day um, and RPG games like Pokemon and this one indie game, To the Moon. <laughs> and uh, we are a team of five programmers, so that means none of us can really draw or make sound or we have to borrow assets from the internet and we hope to change that eventually. We're going to show you our so. Uh, I'm Dave. Um, I work as a game designer. Hi, I'm Jenny. I program most of the animations as well as dealing with sprites in general. Hi, I'm Ray. I do most of the programming for the UI and mapping dialogues into the game. Hi, I'm Faye. I'm the producer and project manage manager of the game. I've also done a bit of everything from programming to a little bit of a um, little bit of art and story. Hi, I'm Perry. I program various systems for the game, such as the dialogue system shown right here. Uh, 
So um, about our game, we made our game in Unity Game Engine, like a lot of other games. <laughs> it's in C Sharp, and it's made for PC, but we're considering importing it into uh, mobile. <coughs> for genres, we have a long list of genres of what our game really is. Um, 2D top-down, non-combat RPG, story-driven, crime mystery, puzzle, and adventure. So the story, you are a high school student who one day finds herself stuck in the same day over and over. And the special thing that happens is at, 10 p. M., uh, at 9 p.m. every night, a man falls down from a building and he dies at midnight. So your goal of the game is to figure out what happened and break out the time loop. And as you play through the game, you'll, you'll realize why you were stuck in the time loop and what happened around Hongsu Town. Our game mechanics, um, as mentioned before, is the time loop. So every day is the same thing. So NPCs, like non-player, non-playable characters, they all, always say the same thing, show up, this, show up at the same time, and um, yeah, they, they show up at the same time, say the same things, and when you come back to the same time next day, they'll do the same thing again. So you can use that to your advantage, talk to them, and um, gain information, and you'll unlock more things that happen later on the story. So this is our game. First, we're going to show you our memory log. This is our unique feature in the game where when characters talk to you, you hear, uh, they, they will have keywords in their dialogue which will be recorded in your memory log. So now, that's the back. That's where your inventory and your items are. So now we're gonna talk to mom, and she talks about bacon and eggs. That's your keyword. So now check your memory log again, and you'll see that bacon and eggs are recorded in, including um, who says it, uh, what's being said, uh, what time, and where. Those information seems like a lot, but you'll really need it when you play our games. And we're gonna take the bacon off the table. And now it's in your back. <laughs> so now we're gonna go outside. This is our overworld map. And you navigate and choose the location you wanna enter. So now we're in the main street. So we're going to talk to this kid, with the stylish hair, and we have choices for our game, where you can choose obviously what you want to say, and different things have different results. Another feature we have is the fast forward, which is helpful for both debugging and playing the game. So we're going to fast forward until the last hour. You guys hear the tick -tock? So now we enter the park. We can still talk to people. You have one last hour block. Uh, every hour block is by two hours. You have one last hour, and the moment you exit the area, you're sent back to the beginning of the day, which is 6 a.m. So now you're back. Um, your memory is still here. Because that doesn't make sense. Why does your memory disappear, right? And, but everything in your inventory is gone. So that's our mechanic. You talk to mom, she'll say the same thing. And if you notice the text box is a different color, that just means that you've seen this dialogue before. So you can go back and get the bacon again, if you want. <coughs> Every NPC has different schedules. So notice that the clock was at 6 a.m. and now we're back at 8. And when you go back to find mom, she's gone. Probably going shopping or something. So every every character has different schedules. There's another way to speed up time, which is to use the bed. So you can restart the day. It's like in Groundhog Day where um, Phil goes to sleep, he wakes up, it's the same day. So it's the same thing here. And that's about it for our game. Um, we would like to thank our Blizzard mentors, uh, Craig, Daryl, Ian, and Matt, they were very helpful for us, and without them, we wouldn't have what you're seeing today. And I would like to thank 
our professors. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were also very helpful to us. And last, I would like to thank all of you who are here. It's a it's a great time to see everyone's games. I'm glad you guys are all here. <laughs> thank you guys. Team Moonlight. If you have questions, you'll have lots of time to oh, ask them. We're on the fourth. We're on the fourth floor. On the fourth so floor. So come visit us. Okay, Team Tavern, come on up. Hello, everyone. My name is Warren. Thank you for coming out tonight. I am a UI programmer and sound integrator. Hey guys, I'm Chris Valencia, and I handle all the game mechanics and uh, implementing art assets and animation. And I also handled uh, particle effects. Uh, I'm Jimmy. I'm AI programmer. I worked on uh, touch base character movement, queuing character actions and movements, and optimization for Android devices. So first, we're going to show you video footage of our tutorial, and then we're going to switch to some live gameplay. So um, our game was built in Unity for Android and iOS. It's a time management game, which means it's very fast paced, it's very challenging. Um, it's about two girls who are running a tavern together. The levels are divided up into the days that the tavern is in business. So day one, which is what you're watching, the tutorial is the first day of business. Um, each level is timed, so you have to serve the customers quickly if you want to pass that level. It's pretty classic for a time management game, but we have a twist, and that's that you're controlling two characters at once. On the right half of the screen, you have Matilda, the waitress, and she's responsible for dealing with customers, such as getting their orders, taking their payments, and um, delivering drinks and finished dishes. And on the left side of the screen, you have Oksana, the waitress, and she's responsible just for cooking, but it's a big task. So these two characters have to work together if you want to serve your customers on time. They rely on each other because only Matilda can deal with the customers, and only Foxana can make dishes. Also, Foxana's cooking tools, such as the oven, grill, and pot, are dependent on the waitress making sure that the furnace is hot. She has to do that by putting logs into the furnace, otherwise her cooking tools won't work. Each girl has two hands that they can carry items in, and you can also queue up their actions. So if you select three things for them to do in a row, then they'll do it automatically. Watching our testers play, people evolve different strategies for how to beat this game. Some people like to prep their dishes beforehand and try to guess what people will order, and other people like to wait for the orders to be made and then try to deal with the dishes one by one or in batches. So this game is all about upgrades. It's about watching your tavern grow by using the profits that you made to upgrade your tools. You can upgrade your cooking tools, like your grill, so you can have more grills, or your grill will cook faster, or you can upgrade your ingredients. So um, if you have higher quality food, you can charge more. You can also upgrade how your tavern looks, like you can see here, this is the final upgrade, so that your customers are happier and then they'll be more patient with you. You can even upgrade your characters because they have RPG stats, such as strength, speed, dex, and luck. Um, if you upgrade their speed, then they'll be able to walk around faster and finish tasks faster, but if you upgrade luck, then they might be able to make more money with the customer. Um, it's up to you what order you want to upgrade your characters or upgrade your cooking tools. It's, you have points, um, experience points, and money, so you can choose what you want to invest, what you've earned in. Um, so, these past two quarters, we were able to finish the main gameplay, but we also have a lot of future feature plans that we're excited about. Um, one is having tiers of customers. So right now, we just have the one customer, but we'd like to have five different kinds that are ranked from the lowest peasant to artisan, middle class, nobility, and royalty. And the idea is that the higher ranked the customer is, then the more they'll pay you, but they'll also be more impatient with you. Um, we'd also like to implement a power-up system in the form of a witch's shop, where if you visit the witch and pay her some money, she'll brew up a potion. It's a, you can use one potion per level, and it'll give you a boost, such as you can make more money for that level, or your character will walk faster just for that one level. It can be very helpful if you're struggling with a level. Um, we 
We'd also like to implement a very basic storyline just to give some flavor to the medieval world and an objective system, such as if you serve 100 customers over the career of your tavern, then you'll get some kind of money reward. We want to say thank you to our mentors from Blizzard, Paul Key, Kevin Newsom, Paul Lackey, and Grant Mark. Um, we're incredibly thankful that they took time out of their day, and their advice has been so invaluable to us, so we really appreciate it. So please come by and try our game. We're on the fourth floor, and we'd be happy to answer any questions and see if you can beat our high scores. <laughs> thank you. Weren't they great? Let's give a hand to all the teams.